Reprise to debate, continuing debate, uh, the Honourable Member for North Island Powell River. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I am so incredibly proud to stand here as the representative of 19 Wing and talk on this issue that profoundly matters, which is housing for the folks that serve us uh, in the military, uh, for those who serve us um, so bravely, not only in Canada, but across the whole world. So today, we, this is a concurrence motion, and we can talk about the political reasons that it was used, uh, but this one was based on a study, a motion that just said that given that rent for Canadian military personnel living on bases is increasing this April, and at a time when the military is struggling to recruit and retain personnel, the committee report to the House that the government immediately cancel all plans to increase rent on military accommodations used by the Department of National Defence. So that's, that's the report, so that one uh, part there. So I'm here uh, to talk about it. This is a concern for my riding. I've had a lot of time uh, to talk with the wing commander about this issue, and I really want to thank him for his incredible work. He'll only be with us until uh, July, and I've really enjoyed uh, working with uh, the Colonel Gagnon. Um, but my concern is very clear that in our region, and I am going to talk about 19 Wing Comox, which is on the territory of the Comox First Nation, and I really appreciate the work that's happening there to build a relationship between those two organizations. But we know that the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation uh, recently let us know that rental vacancy rate for Comox is at a low of 1.4%. And of course, when you have that kind of low rental rate, you also recognize that we have some of the highest costs of housing in our region as well. So the people that are coming to our area, who are recruited into our area, who are serving in our military, are often in a very vulnerable position. And that's very concerning to me. And I think it's, it's really important for all of us as Canadians to understand that they need to be close to the base because when they're called, they can't be driving two hours from their home to get there. So, you know, what they're required to do, especially as somebody at a more entry level, the cost of rent and housing is becoming so burdensome. We know that a healthy rental market requires vacancy rates of between 3 to 5 percent. And we know that the housing on the base is simply not enough. I'm very proud in our riding uh, at the base there that we have the search and rescue training facility. It's been a huge benefit to our community. We see folks from all over the country coming to get training at that facility, trained by some of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life, who are able to go out in dire circumstances and save people, rescue them from things that most of us would run away as quickly as we possibly could. Really happy that that is there. They also built accommodation for the people who are coming to get the training. And that was very frustrating for me because I was hearing stories from so many of our serving members who couldn't find anywhere to live and they saw this facility built and only people who were training were able to stay there. Nobody begrudges that. We want to make sure that when people come and get trained, they have appropriate housing. That makes sense. But if they don't have somewhere for the people who live there to stay, it becomes this issue of, of challenge that I don't think any of us want to see because everybody involved is there to train and to serve our country. And I do know, uh, based on some conversations that I have had, that some of those units have now gone permanently to people who are serving at the base just because there's just not enough. So, you know, again, when we ask people to serve and they have to move from one part of the country to another part of the country, it costs a lot and there's nothing affordable for them to live in, we're really deterring people uh, from providing the service that we need. Now, it, it reminds me of a quote from Ombud Lick from one of the de National Defense uh, Committees where he said to, to the, those of us that were there, how we are treating our military families is, an, is becoming an issue of national security. 
Um, Mr. Speaker, this is very concerning, and I, I don't want to say that's a direct quote, but that very similar, a, pa a paraphrase as it were. Um, but I remember when he said that, thinking, okay, this is great. The whole world is going to hear that. Canada is going to hear that and think, okay, what do we do differently? And I just didn't see the response. I didn't see it from this government. I haven't seen it, quite frankly, from the Conservative government before this. We are really underfunding our, our men and women who serve us. We have to make sure they have the equipment that they need to do their job. We need to make sure that they have the housing that they need. And, they, and we need to support the family. And when you hear things like this, it really does tell us uh, that we need to start looking at this. And I just want to say that, you know, the housing needs report issued in May of 2020 by the town of Comox indicated that they were going to need uh, 7,665 units by 2025 to meet the needs. So that's next year. We're nowhere near that. And a lot of our serving members are the people who rely on that housing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I just, you know, I've written letters, I've talked to the Minister about this issue. I hope that he'll come out and, and meet with me in my riding to really hear the stories of, of our serving men and women. They need the housing, they need that stability. And it, when we look at the numbers of people that are recruiting to our military, we're seeing the numbers start to go down. And I think part of the reason is because there isn't that safety of housing that really is there for people. And so if you're taking, again, at the beginning, you're not making as much money. So if you're spending 60% of your income on housing, how do you fulfill your dreams in the military? And I, I just, you know, in closing, which is gonna be a bit of a long closing, and I know I have a little bit of time, so don't panic anyone, you won't have to speak soon. I just want to say that one of the things that I appreciate so much about representing uh, Comox and the 19 Wing is just the incredible work. I want you to just know that the folks that serve in our military, not only do they do great in their work, they also just volunteer and do great thing in our community. And I also just want to recognize that it is 100 years, the anniversary of the Royal Canadian Air Force. That is something that we should all be you know, recognizing in our communities and being grateful for the amazing people who do this tremendous work. And the Comox Valley Air Force Museum has been working so hard. Uh, you know, they have a beautiful spot right by the, the base where people come as tourists uh, to look at a lot of different planes from different uh, wars and different times in, in the Air Force history. And it's a beautiful place. A lot of people go to see it during the, the Christmas season. They decorate it with lights. It's quite dynamic. Uh, but in 2001, I believe it was, we received in, our, in the 19 wing uh, a vampire. This is a beautiful plane, and it's in fact an artifact. And it's made out of wood. Ima imagine wow. that. Uh, it's a beautiful plane, made out of wood, has a great history, uh, so important for the Royal Canadian Air Force. And we want to make sure that it's displayed with the other planes. So I want to thank David, David Mellon, who's been such an asset to me and kept me updated. The amazing volunteers at the Comox Valley Air Force Museum that are working so hard. They're raising a million dollars, Mr. Speaker, to build a pavilion. It's basically a display case, not a building, a display case that would surround uh, this wooden airplane and allow it to be accessible and seen outside with the other planes that, of course, can weather the beautiful Vancouver Island rainy weather. Uh, so I certainly hope that this government finds it in their heart to find a little bit of money to support this, to recognize that 100 years of service, to recognize the 19 wing and all of the tremendous work that it does. And I want to thank my constituents so much, especially those who serve our country, for the great work that they do and how they continue to keep me educated. But at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, what we really need to see is money for housing. We need to see money on the, uh, for housing on the bases so that people have a safe place to call home, an affordable place to call home, so that when they serve our country, they have that stability. And if we don't do that, what we're going to see is less people offering to do this tremendously important work. So thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to answering folks' questions. Well, it was great being here tonight, to, to talking about be, being being the sister base, the 14 wing in Greenwood. So it's nice to be a be a part of the discussion here this evening. Uh, questions and comments, Kessia Kamaltar, uh, the honourable member for uh, for. 
Courtney Alberti, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's okay, thank you, it's Mr. Late. Speaker. And, and I can't say enough um, uh, how, how hardworking my colleague is from North Island Power River, the advocacy she's done for veterans and the people at 19 Wing and Comox, because I also represent uh, Courtney in the Comox Valley, where many of our military veterans and military personnel live, as well as I represent uh, 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 the CFMETR Navy Base at Nanus, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank all of those that serve uh, and their families uh, from all of us. I, I, I think we can all agree that we appreciate the work they do. But I will say this, Ombudsman Lick highlighted uh, in his report about the serious situation, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, that the military is facing. He cited that actually how we treat our military families and military personnel is an issue of national security, Mr. Speaker. And we know that the, the decade under the Conservatives, there was cuts, uh, the treatment of, uh, of our military, the treatment of veterans, it was appalling. And I'm hoping my colleague can speak about how this government has also failed and how we need to urgently repair the damage done to those military personnel and their families and how we owe it to them, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that they have a safe place to live. Honourable Member for North Island Powell River. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member. I really enjoy uh, having a border with him, and we work together collaboratively on all of the issues that face uh, the, the military folks in our region because it is really important. And I, I guess what I would say is that I think it's important for us as Canadians to understand what our military does, the, the great work it does both nationally and internationally, and understand that if we don't start looking at military as a whole family, um, that like Ombud Lick said, we could be getting to a point where we don't have enough people to serve our country and it be, could become very quickly an issue of national security. So, you know, it, it includes how housing. It includes working with families. We know that a lot of spouses uh, really have a challenging time moving from place to place, keeping their seniority uh, in the work that they do. So we have to look at what military families need and do much better by them. Thank you. Questions and comments? Kiss your comment there. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, she's correct about uh, Ombud Lick. He did say uh, this and uh, another important voice to be heard on this is actually the Chief of Defence Staff himself who has cited the crisis of retention and recruitment as perhaps the most critical crisis of the forces among the many crises facing the forces. And we know that family issues are one of the key drivers of people out of the forces, housing being probably the number one on that list. Uh, so I know that she she's, serves a, and represents a military uh, area. So if she would like, um, I'll ask her to talk about how these family issues, especially when posting, when postings change, how that, that creates a trigger point for many members to leave the, uh, the CAF. The Honourable Member for North Island Powell River. Well, I, I really appreciate the question, and I have to say, you know, I am the spokesperson on Veterans Affairs, and one of the things we've just finished studying and are working on the report is, is around women veterans. And it was so interesting to hear from them where they sort of had that moment of making decisions to stay or to leave and what the impacts were. And, you know, one of the things that I have had frank conversations with is the fact that the military, we're not back in the 50s or the 40s anymore. It's a totally different world. You know, you need both people in the family working uh, to sustain yourself. So how do you make sure both people have an opportunity? You know, childcare comes up, housing comes up. Things that matter to everyday Canadians matter to military people, and their work is very unique. And we have to honour that and find ways to support them. And I think that government needs to be a key part of that, because if they aren't, it's obviously never going to get done. Thank you for the question. 